In this video, we're going to talk about zone protection profiles in a Palo Alto device. Now, the first question you come up with is what exactly is a zone protection profile? Well, if we look at our network diagram here, the idea behind a zone protection profile is that we can protect a zone with a profile. I know, let's, let's talk about super crazy ideas right here. Protecting a zone pro with a profile. What that basically means is out here, say in the public VLAN, we have a hacker. Uh, this hacker is very mean and he wants to get into our environment. So that hacker is trying to get into our firewall in order to attack our Linux or our servers or even into our desktop networks. And so what we want to do is we want to be able to protect ourselves by applying something here on the public VLAN or the public zone that protects us from that hacker. And it's just that it's it's just that simple is it helps us protect our environment or more specifically protect us from that zone from attackers of some sort. So a zone protection profile can do a lot of different things. Uh, protects us against flood attacks. Uh, there's a couple of different types of flood attacks. The first one is called a TCP SYN attack. Uh, if you're familiar with the TCP three-way handshake, basically what you do is you do a SYN. Uh, the client talks to the server and it says, hey, SYN or synchronize with me. The server responds back with an ACK or an acknowledgement, and then finally a SYN ACK. Uh, so a TCP SYN attack, basically what happens is this very first SYN is sent from the client and then never responds back. Uh, so, the, uh, so the client sends a SYN, the server then responds back with an acknowledgement, and the client never responds back again. Uh, basically, it's based a uh, way of saying, hey, I need to talk to you and then never talking to that person ever again. Uh, so a whole bunch of people talking to a server saying, hey, I need to talk to you can very quickly overwhelm the server thinking everybody wants to talk to him so much so that they can't talk to anybody else. Other type of uh, flood attacks is just simply packet flooding. We're just flooding the packet, flooding you full of packets so you can't handle any additional packets. It can also protect you against reconnaissance attacks. People will do host scans and port scans in your environment to see which hosts are live in your environment and which ports are live in your environment. And you can help protect yourself against these with a zone profile. And then lastly, packet-based attacks such as spoofed IPs, fragmentation, Christmas tree attacks, other malformed packet attacks, and so on. So how do we do this? Well, let's go ahead and jump into a uh, network device here, into one of our firewalls. In order to set this up, what we do is we come on up here to network. Yes, network. And then on the left-hand side, under network profiles, we have zone protection. And pretty obvious at this point, it's empty. So we click down here at the bottom where it says add. So let's go ahead and add a new zone protection. Let's call this uh, internet since we want to protect ourselves from the internet. And here we have lots of different options. Uh, for instance, under flood protection, we have sin attacks. How do we protect ourselves from sin attacks? Uh, first off, let's talk about the alarm rate. This says that after 10,000, there we go, 10,000 connections per second, create an alarm. So it's just going to throw something in the event log and tell me that there's an abnormally high number of sin, uh, sin attempts to my system. Uh, activate. At what point do we start doing something active against our attacks? And again, that's also at 10,000. And then maximum, what is the absolute maximum we should ever allow in our environment? And that's 40,000. Now these numbers, you're going to want to definitely baseline. Uh, you, you want to make sure that you look through your environment and baseline your environment and make sure you're coming up with the right levels for your environment. 10,000 for the alarm rate, maybe that's really, really too high. Maybe you're a really low-end system or low-end uh, throughput on your environment 
and 10,000 is just really, really high. So you could lower that to 5,000. Maybe you're a high throughput environment and a maximum of 40,000 is just way too low. So you can increase that as well, all based off of your baseline. So we have two different types of actions here. One is random early drop. And what that means is it just randomly drops some of these packets. Once you've reached the activation level, it will just randomly drop some of our synchronous at, um, at, uh, connections. And for the TCP stack, that's not really that hard. Uh, TCP is designed to uh, reconnect and retry if something fails. So if we randomly drop a TCP packet, it's just going to retry later and everything will work fine. Very little uh, performance impact or very little end user change will be viewed. Sorry, very little end user impact will be uh, obvious to the end users. The other option is sin cookies. And what this does basically is it allows you to, uh, instead of uh, when you receive a SYN request, instead of acknowledging that and keeping that connection open, what it does is instead is it keeps a cookie for that connection and keeps the con and closes the connection on the server's end. That way, when the client finally responds back to finalize the connection request, uh, it then uses that cookie to finalize the connection as opposed to keeping the port open. It's just a way for it to be able to say, oh, hey, I know who you were. You previously talked to me. Uh, now let's keep going. Uh, the SYN cookies, I believe, take up a little bit more power, a little bit more overhead on the environment. So random early drop is the default. So that's for the TCP SYN requests. Uh, you have something similar for UDP. Um, instead of being able to choose SYN cookies because UDP does not use uh, SYN uh, synchronize requests. It only has random early drop. Alarm rate, activate, and maximum exactly the same uh, levels as with the SYN. And then same with ICMP, ICMPv6, and all other IP type requests. Turn these on if you need them. If you don't, you're probably better off not turning them on because you never know you might break your something by blocking ICMP requests in your environment. So as for flood protection, the next one is reconnaissance protection. There's some very common tools that are used out there. Uh, more specifically, Nmap is a common Linux utility, uh, stands for network mapper. And with Nmap, what we can do is we can do a host sweep. I can give it a uh, segmentation of a network, such as uh, 192.168. Dot 12 dot zero slash 24 and it will sweep across all of the hosts very very quickly and tell me which ones are online by by enabling this for the host sweep what it says is hey if there are a hundred events within 10 seconds I'm going to identify that as a host sweep and currently alert based off of that Along with Nmap, not only can I do a host sweep, I can also do a TCP port scan, which in theory scans all the way from port one up through port 65,535 and tells me if those ports are live or not. And so the Palo Alto will look at that and say, hey, if there are 100 events within two seconds, go ahead and do something. Same thing with UDP, so not, not just TCP, but also UDP scans. Nmap, again, uh, will allow me to do this quickly and easily against the environment. So easy that you could probably do it without even knowing what you're doing. Uh, and so the Palo Alto can help protect me against that. So the alert actions, we have uh, alert, uh, basically just throw something in the event log so that the administrator can see it at a later date. The other options are allow. Go ahead and allow the pack, the traffic to go through. Don't alert on it, just completely ignore it altogether. Uh, block, go ahead and block the end user. If I see more than 100 events in two seconds, block that user from being able to access my machine. Or lastly, block IP. And the block IP gives me a couple more options. How do I want to track this? Do I just want to track the source 
or do I want to track against the, both the source that they're coming from and the destination that they're going to? And then with that, how long do I want to block them for? Uh, if I type in, for instance, 600 here, 600 seconds is 10 minutes. Yes. Uh, so then I can go ahead and I can say, if I see somebody doing a TCP scan on my environment, I'm going to block their IP for 600 seconds. And so for the next 10 minutes, that person will not be able to scan my environment at all. Essentially means that they can't do anything for 10 minutes. So if they are scanning my environment, they can only do a little bit at a time. There are some scenarios where uh, you may need to add in a source address exclusion. More specifically, there are some uh, uh, vulnerability scanning tools. Vulnerability scanning tools that I may actually want to be able to do TCP, UDP, and host scans on my environment. And so I can go ahead and I can add in those vulnerability scanning tools as an exclusion so that they are not affected by any of those protections. Additionally, there's packet-based protection. Uh, and this looks at a lot of the various aspects of the packet, such as spoofed IP addresses. If somebody spoofs an IP address to make it look like it's coming from inside, this will block them from being able to access the environment. Uh, I can look for anything that has like uh, messed up routing identified in it or is malformed. Um, anything with TCP dropping or mismatching segments. Uh, ICMP packets can be dropped if they're larger than 1K in size. Uh, same thing for IPv6 and ICMPv6. And then lastly, protocol exclusion. Uh, I can add in specific protocols that are included or excluded as necessary. All right, so let's see what I've gone ahead and done in here. I've gone ahead and I've checked all of these options. I should probably evaluate my system and traffic to see if I should be doing this before I do it, but we'll see what happens. Uh, reconnaissance, I'm protecting myself against TCP port scans. Uh, let's go ahead and throw in all the others. Uh, alerts, fine. Uh, Packet-based protection, I've got those guys right there. And then protocol, all right. So at that point, I now have a zone protection profile. I've called it internet. Uh, now I just need to apply that to my zone. Now I know you're thinking, where do I apply a zone protection profile? And, and the words right there are zone protection profile. How do I apply this to my zone? And you're thinking, well, I need to go to the zone. And we're already there, we're halfway there anyway. Uh, we're already on the network tab. And up here, up at the top of the list, we have zones. So I go ahead and I click zones and I choose my public zone. My public zone is what's connected to the internet. So I'll go ahead and click that. And right down here at the bottom, we see zone protection. And we can specify a zone protection profile. There's only one in there right now. So I'll go ahead and allow that. And then, okay. At this point, commit and you're ready to go.